Hey everybody, uh, welcome to the Trinity Roundtable where today we're going to talk about a Christian's obligation to vote. I'm Chelsea Commodal. I am a uh, contributor, a writer, a mentor for uh, Trinity International. And today I am honored to be joined by three of our mentees in our mentor program for this session. And I'm going to let them introduce themselves. Hi, my name is Brooke Chilla. I am a third year law student and uh, will be graduating here in the next six months. Um, I am currently located in North Dakota. I um, am in the mentee program in Tennessee and I am really excited about today's roundtable. Okay, um, well, I'm Samuel, I'm from Spain. I'm currently studying leadership, entrepreneurship and innovation. And I just joined Trinity because uh, my political conversion played a real uh, important uh, role in my spiritual conversion as well. So it's very personal for me. Hi, my name is Ivana. I'm from Southern California and I've um, graduated with my bachelor's degree. And I joined Trinity to be with like-minded individuals. And so far it's been great. So I'm very happy to be here. Awesome. And I am so happy that all of you are here. Um, for those of you who don't know me, maybe from the Instagram page or my writing, I'm a fourth year PhD student at the University of Kansas. I'm studying uh, organic chemistry and I should be wrapping up my degree in the next uh, year and a half or so. I'm originally from North Carolina. I moved out here to the Midwest to get my degree and I am looking forward to moving back home in the next uh, couple years, hopefully. So today we are going to talk, like I said, about a Christian's obligation to vote. And this is obviously a, um, an important message, uh, considering we are less than a month out from the presidential election for 2020 here in the United States. And um, in order to answer this question, um, or at least delve into this topic, we're going to go through three specific questions. Um, the first is, uh, what does it mean to live by a biblical worldview in 2020? The second question is, what does the Bible say about the role of government and how are we to view elected leaders and politicians? And the third question is, what does the Bible say about the following topics? And we are going to discuss freedom, abortion, socialism, and injustice. So we're going to get right into this. Um, <clears throat> so what does it look like in 2020 to live by a biblical worldview? Um, I think there are three points that we have to come to an agreement with as Christians when, um, when discussing this this question of a biblical worldview. Uh, the first is that we must believe that the Bible is a living, breathing document that is still relevant to us today. Um, reading from the NIV, Hebrews 4.12 says, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword, it penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitude of the heart. Now, I mean, do we need much more than that, you know, to describe the scripture? Notice it doesn't say that the Bible was living or the Bible was active. It is. It was at the time of writing. It is today and it forever will be. And if we as Christians can't come to grips with that, then, you know, we're not in the best shape uh, to start out. But we're going to keep going through um, some examples of scripture here. Second Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says that all scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So just from those two passages, we take away that the word of God is active in the life of a believer, or at least that it should be, right? If the word of God does not actively teach, rebuke, correct, or train you as a Christian when you read it, then I would encourage you as a Christian to maybe check your heart and see, you know, what it is about the Bible that is, um, that's disconnecting from you. Um, because we should be willing to read the things that are in the Bible and allow them to change us. And along those lines, a really great quote from an article on the blog, Disruptus Renovatus said this, the biblical text must first interpret us before we seek to interpret it. 
And I want everyone to keep that in mind as we go through this, because I think much of our society today, in terms of our Christian uh, population, is more uh, willing to interpret the gospel through their own experience or through their own lens of feelings or emotions, when that is the exact opposite of the way that we should be interpreting the Bible. Um, there's evidence, of course, of scripture's relevance within our world today. Some examples we're not going to go through, but I want you to look them up. Um, Leviticus 17, 11, Ecclesiastes 1, 6, and 7, and Job 36, 27 through 29 actually provide a few examples of scientific observations today that are confirmed by the scripture. So, um, you know, not only do we have to consider that um, the Bible is living and breathing, it is also relevant in our society. And Brooke is going to talk to us right now uh, briefly about a passage in Romans that is going to support scripture's relevance in our society today. So um, scripture that um, I would direct everyone to read fully is Romans uh, chapter 1, verses 18 through 32. Um, the thing that is really um, striking about it is that it shows how relevant that mankind doesn't change. And this is Paul writing to the Romans during the apostle times. And it, you can see it as if we're in 2020 in the United States. And, you know, so for me, that's something that it's a very big example of saying, yeah, you could say people are wicked, but you look at it and you're seeing that this is very relevant. So I would encourage everyone to see that because it's not, you know, it's not, us that's you know we've been the same god is the one that's going to help us um and he's the only one that can actually save us yep absolutely do you guys have any thoughts on that sam or ivana yeah i agree absolutely it's pretty like nowadays it's the same thing it's really actual yeah uh, speaking of biblical worldview um it's just that it's very relevant um to us today that we should see through a biblical lens. Um, when I think of biblical worldview, I think of it as the cornerstone for um, that your ideology depends on. So it becomes your filter and um, that standard is created by God. Um, and I, I've heard from a lot of people, you know, just talking to people, they would say, oh, well, isn't that a biased opinion or that doesn't allow you to fully look at the situation. And, and actually it allows the opposite. It allows you to look at a situation in its entirety, no matter what you're going through in life. And it allows you to see the truth and it deflects deceit and it deflects all the, the mess that the world tries to bring on and, and the lies. And because God is just, because he is truthful and his word is objective and it applies to everything, that's the ultimate standard that we could use, that worldview um, to look upon everything. And so because he is a God of order and not confusion, this is something that applies to everything in our life. So that makes it completely relevant in 2020. Absolutely. Yeah. I would like to bring up uh, an, in addition to that, because uh, he was talking about uh, the truth and uh, also about like objectivity. So I think the difference between us uh, who are called uh, to be light and salt and the worldview of the people from the world is like uh, they they have a postmodernistic uh, kind of uh, lenses, and that sets some principles. For example, they have this principle that uh, uh, Rousseau settled that uh, all of us we are good by nature. Is the society that uh, make uh, make us corrupt? But actually, we are corrupt in society and not in the inverse way. They are their own gods. They depend on themselves and they judge themselves. They don't want confrontation. They are good at their own opinion. And also they don't like common sense if that challenges their sense and perspective of reality. So they, they clearly say to you, there's no such thing as an absolute truth, but you can reply back. So is that an absolute truth? There's no such thing as an absolute truth. So the problem is they don't want to think if, if that challenges their sense of reality. And um, they fear two words that are absolute truth. For them, absolute truth is something really challenging because they feel they are not in control and they are going to be judged in some way. Yeah, 
absolutely. Thank you. Thank you both for that. Um, yeah, <laughs> I mean, I can't say it much better than that, um, honestly. And uh, Sam just took us into what we're going to talk about a little bit in this next um, next point that I want to make. But just very quickly before we get there, Isaiah 47 and 8 says, the grass withers and the flowers fall when the breath of the Lord blows on them. Indeed, the people are grass. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And it, and it mattered 2000 years ago, right? It endured then, it has endured until today, and it matters just as much today as it did then. So once we understand and believe that the Bible is still relevant to us today, we must then believe that the Bible is the only source of objective truth and that it is unchanging. And Sam just gave us a really great lead into this. Um, it is absolutely no secret at this point that American culture has embraced full-scale postmodernism, like Sam uh, mentioned, and he's in Spain, uh, just to keep that in mind. But America, I mean, he can probably speak to it in Spain as well, but in America, we have embraced this movement of postmodernism that was created in the late 20th century that embraces broad skepticism, subjectivism, and relativism. And God's word, um, we have to believe that it is his message to all of us and that it is the lone source of truth in this world um, from the time it was written until today and for all of time. Um, in John 8, 31 and 32, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And that's a big point, freedom, that we're going to talk about in a little bit. Um, but the Bible um, absolutely consists of God's words and God's word is authoritative in our lives, or at least as Christians, it should be. Um, Jesus said again in Matthew 28, 18, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And if we believe that the word of God is just that, the word of God, and that Jesus was um, God incarnate, then, um, you know, we have to believe that his authority is carried out in the Bible. And um, for these reasons, a society that embraces subjectivism and relativism cannot acknowledge the objectively true word of God. And that speaks to the, um, the rejection and the opposition to the idea of objective truth that Sam just mentioned to us. And um, in the words of Dr. John MacArthur at Grace Community Church in California, um, he said, perhaps the greatest lie of postmodernism is the belief that we can define, a, or, sorry, that we can define truth and determine reality from within ourselves. But the subjective realm of feelings and impressions is the worst place to go in any quest for truth. And, you know, in the Bible, it says, you know, who can comprehend the heart, the human heart, right? It is evil, it is um, deceptive, and, you know, so by default, you know, if we believe that that's true, we cannot look within ourselves for objective truth. Um, I think today Christians sort of want it both ways, right? They want to be allowed to cherry pick the parts of scripture that they like while they disregard the parts that go against the culture. Um, the message within the Bible is hands down, not dependent on the culture. If we as Christians do not believe that, then why do we believe the Bible? Why are we Christian? Um, I would challenge anyone who, you know, does not hold to the full truth of the Bible to ask themselves that question, because to believe only some of scripture is to believe none of it. And that is a fact. We have to believe that the Bible from Genesis to Revelation is true 100%. In Revelation 3.16, Jesus told the church at Laodicea, so because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. Jesus despises the lukewarm. And what that means today, I believe, is the people who cherry pick from scripture. He would prefer that you be fully cold than to be lukewarm. And I think there are going to be a lot of modern day Christians in this country who will be spit from the mouth of Jesus. That is a fact. And so if you don't believe that the word is objectively true as a whole, then why are you Christian is what I would ask you. So um, your thoughts on that, guys, what, um, you know, do you have anything to add? Um, in regards to uh 
there being Christians that will be spit out. Of course, there is that. Um, I know that a few Christians think that, oh, well, once I accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, I can do whatever I want. And that's a fallacy that that has been spread because in all actuality, yes, Jesus died for your sins. But at the same time, you have to put forth the effort and you've been reborn when you're baptized. You've done that. But you have to also um, act in, in accordance with the life that you've just been reborn into. Otherwise, it's just, you know, just a slap in the face to uh, the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross. So, yes, I, I completely agree. And I'd love to hear everyone else's thoughts on this. Um. I would say I'm really more worried about these lukewarm Christians, New Age Christians, than the unbelievers, because I was an unbeliever, and uh, the gospel and its principles and moral values as well just uh, punched me. But when you are in the midst, it's more complicated to get convinced of that truth. And I want to bring up the intolerance paradox. The problem discussing with these people is like, well, I'm a Christian, but I want to uh, tolerate the other people's choice uh, to live or to do this thing or the other thing. But the problem is, it's not about I'm intolerant and you are tolerant, because if I'm asking you, you are tolerant to rape, you, you would say that, no, you don't tolerate rape. So once we have said that we are both intolerant, the question is, what are you tolerating and what are you not tolerating? And if you are a Christian, what things you should to tolerate and what things you shouldn't tolerate. Because the problem is that when the church uh, finds like a kind of middle ground with the world, that's, that's, not, that, that's not the church and still being the world because the people wants to look religious uh, still. Uh, the problem is not to look religious, it's to real, uh, uh, really following these principles. Uh, when they were making business on the temple, Jesus was mad because that, that was kind of trying to find middle ground between the church and the world, but that was still the world that, was, that wasn't the, the temple. Right. right. What about you, Ivana? Um, one verse that comes to mind is Romans 12, 2, and be not conformed to this, this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what that is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And then there's also the scripture that says, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. So if you are first seeking the kingdom of God, you're choosing not to be conformed to the world, then you're already choosing to follow in the standards of Christ. Then if you're um, here, it also says to be ready to give a defense. So that means that you're understanding what you believe in, you know, the scripture. And if that's the case, then you should not have to come up with any um, other new reasons or, or ideas such as tolerance, because you'll know that the word of God is, um, teaches enough respect, it allows enough respect to remove, I mean, and um, space for everyone to have their own beliefs, while still there being a level of respect. However, it does not give you any room to change the word of God in your life or for anyone else. The word of God is unchangeable. And that is also another point of objective truth. Earlier, Sam brought up um, absolute truth. So objectivity is in complete opposite of subjectivity, which the world is um, leaning towards in this year of 2020, which is also about self. So um, that's what we're dealing with. It's not only the issue of trying to be pleasing to the world, um, but it's fighting off that lukewarm spirit that's really heavy in these times. Absolutely. Man, thank you all for that contribution. I love it. Sound teaching. Um, okay, so we've gone through um, understanding these fundamental truths about scripture. Um, if we do not believe these things that we've gone through, then it is impossible to live by a biblical worldview. So if we do understand and believe these things that we have walked through, meaning that we want to live in a biblical worldview, we have to know what scripture says in order to live by its truths and its teaching. 
Um, this is not a recommendation, right? We as Christians are commanded to know and obey what God says. Hosea 4, 6 says, my people are destroyed from lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I also reject you. So God is saying that to his people. You have to know me or else I do not know you. Um, conversely, 2 Timothy 2.15 says, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. There are a lot of Christians today who are incorrectly handling the word of God. They are correctly mishandling the teachings of scripture in order to fit the culture and fit the narrative. And it is absolutely unacceptable. God does not honor that whatsoever. Um, there is no way right now in this country or anywhere in the world for Christians to obey and follow and live by the word of God if we don't know what the word of God says. Um, if we don't truly understand the word in its context, context is key, then it is easy to misconstrue and, ap uh, and apply the word of God in ways in which it was never intended by God for us to use it. And in taking scripture out of context, we condone things as Christians that we have absolutely no business condoning or tying our wagon to as Christians. And there's a lot of that happening in our country today and all around the world. Romans 132 says, although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to practice these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. Okay, so we as Christians are guilty right now of not only practicing that which is contradictory to the Bible, but we are condoning those who practice it as well. And that deserves death. It says it right there. Um, Peter said in 2 Peter 3.16 that ignorant and unstable people distort scripture to their own destruction. That's powerful. I mean, it will destroy you to mishandle the word of God. And we're going to look at some explicit examples of that a little bit later on. But um, the biblical worldview in 2020 has to acknowledge that we are to be ruled not by our own emotions, not by the culture, but by God's word only. God's word is the sole authority over all of our lives. It does not change with the culture. We strive to further this message of the word and live out its truths personally each and every day. God is unchanging, as is his word. Um, Dr. Uh, Roger Wilmore, uh, who's a pastor at a church in Alabama, said, when the lordship of Jesus is a settled issue in the Christian's life, all other issues are settled. So I ask you, Christian, who's watching this, are these issues within our world settled in your mind and in your heart because they are settled in scripture? If not, then I ask you again, where, where are you getting your information? What, what Bible are you reading? And so again, we're going to look into some examples of um, issues in the culture today and what scripture says about them. Um, but Luke 646 summarizes this very clearly when he's uh, in Jesus in that sorry, in that verse, Jesus says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, if you do not do what I say? So I just want to leave you with that. As Christians, we personally, first and foremost, must know, believe, and obey the word of God before we ever examine the culture or the issues in our society. So quickly, before we move on to uh, question number two, are there any additional thoughts on that? No, I think you summed it up perfectly. So I'd like to you're what anyone else has to say. I agree. Okay. All right. So big question number two, now that we've examined a biblical worldview, question number two is, what does the Bible say about the role of government and how are we to view elected leaders and politicians according to the Bible? Um, the first and uh, most frequently cited reference to answer this question is Romans 13, 1 through 7. And this passage as a whole, I would recommend that you read it. It has two questions or two messages that I'm going to sum up for us here. The first is that no authority exists on earth outside of what God has established. Number two, we are to submit ourselves to the governing authority. This and this alone is where we are to put our hope as Christians, okay, that God puts every elected leader in that position, 
okay? Um, this does not mean that we are to obey man over God when faced with that decision, um, when that comes up legally. Um, of course, the book of Daniel is a great example of that when uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego went into the fiery furnace and, um, you know, God carried them through that. Um, the passage in verse 4 of that uh, Romans 13, 1 through 7 uh, does say that those in authority are God's servant for our good which I think is interesting because, you know, God's servant carries some sort of weight, right? And oftentimes politicians and leaders are morally corrupt, or at least are not Christian. So what do we take away from this statement as Christians? Because obviously not all leaders in our country or around the world are followers of God, yet God has explicitly called them through Paul, his servants. And so I think that what we need to take away from this is number one, that God is sovereign over all things, even the wicked, and therefore he can use evil in leadership to bring about his loving purposes for the world. So think about Joseph being sold into slavery, right? Or like allowing Jesus to be crucified by evil people who rejected him as he was. Um, that um, we need to know as well that God can also use evil enacted by worldly people to drive his people back to himself, like um, when he allowed Babylon to rule over his people Israel. Um, so going through that very um, quick, I guess, analysis of government um, as laid out in the Bible, um, do you guys have any thoughts on this biblical vision of the government? Um, I have something to add. It's more along the lines of viewing government as the ultimate answer. So if you view a political uh, loss as a catastrophe, then you also have to accept that you view a political win as a salvation, as an answer to everything. And so now that politics and that politician and that win or that loss has become your religion. It's replaced God and now you view that as your salvation. Um, so we have to be very mindful of that and that in the end, you really have to trust God, but you also, you know, know what you're actually, who look at who you're voting for, research them, not only what they say, but what their record is in the past, what they, you know, conduct speech speaks more than words do. Um, so I have, I just stressed that point. Um, and so if anyone else has anything to add. Yeah, um, I would say that, yeah, I completely agree. Uh, this is becoming a kind of new idolatry. Um, I think uh, people is replacing the secure we have and the trust we have in God and the dependence we have on God to the dependence on the government. If I have uh, financial issues, the government will solve it. If I have sickness, uh, government will fix it. If I have uh, some, I, I don't want to work, uh, the government will pay for me for just stay in my home. So the government is uh, kind of an ally for me that is helping me to reach out my goals, but uh, that, that was not meant to be the role of government. Uh, the government is just to protect uh, uh, good convivence and security but not for giving you the desires of your heart or nor give you the purpose of your life. So the problem is we are changing Jesus for the Caesar, okay? If the Caesar is bad, God put him there and we have to respect that and we, we, are, uh, we are commanded to pray for the Caesar. And we have to pay, for example, the taxes. Um, that was a provocation because... The question made sense. That was unfair to pay the ta taxes to the Caesar. But anyway, we are commanded to pray for that Caesar to respect the laws, even though they are unju unjust, unfair, and, and we, owe, we own that to, to God. But that doesn't mean that we replace God for the Caesar. And the people is replacing completely God for the Caesar and depending on the Caesar, not on God. So I think this is becoming a new kind of idolatry. And by the other hand, um, I think sometimes when we have an issue of um, confrontation between the God commandment and the government commandment, we really have to pray about it and uh, think if the government is really quitting us uh, doing our moral obligations. And COVID-19, I think, brings up 
uh, with this kind of um, restrictions on churches and and uh, the lockdown situation. I think this is a big issue. We we can have that conversation other day, but I think that re restrictions um, bring that. Uh, question about uh, is really government uh, quitting me from doing my moral obligations and the last thing I'm I'm gonna say is uh, sometimes we ask why God is uh, is letting uh, like really evil people like Kim Jong-un or or um, uh, Maduro in Venezuela uh, why is God letting them rule a country well we actually uh, don't know the mind of God and we cannot pretend to know the mind of God but we know one thing when the misery is at its high level when injustice is at its high level and when there's persecution the the church grows up so for example China is a very dangerous country and I really hate all the China's government uh, uh, organization but I really know that God is letting that situation happen because the, the, the church in China, a real church, a strong church, um, is growing up uh, faster than ever. So praise the Lord for that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Sam. What about you, Ivana? I agree with everything that you guys said. Um, I think the foundation of all this is that God ordained government. Um, right now we see so many Christians trying to... Um, that are agreeing with the world, siding with the world, and trying to dismantle um, things based off of their own emotions and ideas. And um, they take the Bible out of it and don't realize that God, just the idea of government triggers people. But God, like I said earlier, is a God of order. And there is a purpose for all that he does. And um, while Sam mentioned, there's a lot of um, uh, corruption in different areas of the world. Um, but there's also free will in this world, but God makes a plan out of the free will. So he allows things to happen. And so, like was said earlier, who are we to try to understand the mind of God? Um, what's happening is a part of his plan. And uh, especially in 2020, I've been hearing so much discouragement from Christians who are still confused at what's happening. Uh, they think that everything is um, coming down and and I'm like, have you read your Bible? Everything that I heard you preach last year, everything that you were singing in church last year, do you not believe in the victory that you once said that you had? Do you not believe in your sovereign almighty God? He is unchanging. And if you believe that, if he's all powerful, then you believe that he still has a hand in what goes on today. And that applies to government too. And there's a scripture, which I'm not sure if someone mentioned it already, but Romans 13.1. Um, let every soul be subject unto higher powers. Um, there's no power but God, but the powers that be are ordained of God. Um, and we need to respect what the Bible says, whether you like the person who's been ordained or, or not. And um, that's what we're seeing. And we're, we'll probably talk about it later on too, a lot of the division that's going on um, because of different beliefs. Um, but that's what we're seeing right now. And it's um, a little it's disheartening, but we know the truth and what's going on. Absolutely. Man, thank y'all. That's great. Um, yeah, you guys are bringing a lot of good insight, and I hope our our listeners are able to acknowledge that we are all 20-somethings, right? And we are all, you know, in situations on campus or fresh off campus where, you know, we're faced with a lot of conflicting views, uh, you know, considering what we're saying right now. And I hope that you'll just acknowledge, and I feel for some reason that I really need to acknowledge this right now, that, you know, we are all speaking very boldly for the truth. And we hope that this will be an encouragement to those of you who are maybe in the same situations as us, and you don't have that support system, you don't have, um, you know, that community where you feel that you can express your beliefs in Jesus and the truth of his word and be heard. Trinity is a home for you. And I just feel like I need to say that all of these mentees here have found a home in Trinity where they can share these beliefs with like-minded individuals. And I encourage, you know, if you're, if you're in that position where you, you don't have that, then please get connected with us for sure. So, um, Getting back to where we were, um, you know, absolutely, biblically, our hope is not in the government, period. 
nor is it in any mortal man or woman elected to public office. Our hope is in Jesus alone. Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And this includes every single politician as well as us. Um, to put our hope in elected officials only shows how short-sighted we are. But saying all of that, does this mean that we as Christians are exempt from being aware or from participating in politics and elections? The answer is unequivocally, absolutely not. Um, Christians, the reality, of course, is that our hope is in God. That is not an excuse for us to sit idly by and pray that God just fixes everything for us while taking no action personally to um, enact the prayer ourselves. And, you know, that's negligent, that's irresponsible, it lacks personal agency, and personal agency is something we're going to talk about more in a little bit, but we should put our prayer into action. And I would just say our politicians, of course, are not perfect people. But, um, you know, to expect them to be perfect is absolutely naive. We all have a past. We all have things that we're not proud of. And we as Christians should know more than anyone how, how wrong it is to hold the, the past sins of someone against them, especially if they are a redeemed and born again Christian, right? Because God forgets our sins um, when we allow them to be covered by salvation and his grace. Our politicians are not perfect people. So where do we draw this line, right? Where, where do we look at a politician and say, well, you know, he said this thing or he did this thing and that's not great. It, it doesn't sit well with me. So what really matters um, is, you know, what we're, what we're trying to figure out here. And, you know, I think as believers, we obviously have to pray for guidance in this, but we also must ask ourselves, what does the Bible say about the issues that are facing our nation? And very importantly, um, forget what a candidate verbally supports, okay? Because words and politics are very cheap. Um, forget what they say. What does a politician believe about an issue? That is what we should be asking. We have to consider their beliefs as supported by their record, as Brooke said earlier. And, you know, what do they believe about the sanctity of life? What do they believe about, you know, X, Y, or Z, fill in the blank for an issue? What do they believe about that? And if their belief does not align with the biblical worldview, then we are not to vote for that candidate. It is not that hard. Um, you know, obviously, when we view our government through the lens of scripture, it's important that we remember that and hold the outlook that man-made laws do nothing to change the immutable truth of God's word. God's word is true no matter what the law says in this country or any other country. However, our laws do affect our life and they affect our society, including our right to free religious expression. When you vote for a candidate, you're voting for their worldview. And it's our duty as Christians to elect not perfect people, but those who will uphold and support the immutable truths to the best of their ability. And likewise, it is our duty to reject those whose beliefs and worldviews do not align with scripture. That like period, nothing else needs to be said for that. That is our duty by scripture. If we live by a biblical worldview and we know what the Bible says about the issues, we are without excuse as Romans one says, we are without excuse to do what the Bible says. So, with that being said, we have set up the background and the foundation for how we are to um, form our own opinions about the issues in our world. And so now we're going to go through some of those issues. Um, and so what does the Bible say about some of the following topics? We're going to talk about freedom, abortion, socialism, and injustice. And so with freedom, we want to talk about this one first because we're going to use this as sort of a larger um, springboard for some of these other issues. Um, also, as an American, you know, freedom is a big thing that people just kind of associate with America, but um, the Bible is replete with mentions of freedom, specifically freedom from sin. And 2 Corinthians 3.17 says, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. John 8, 36 says, if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Ephesians 3, 12 says, in him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. 
lastly, Acts 13, 39 says, through him, everyone who believes is set free from every sin, a justification you were not able to obtain under the law of Moses. So the Bible likes freedom, right? Um, however, it is also very clear that this freedom is not a freedom to act in any way that we please as humans. We are not to throw around this grace frivolously with no account of our actions. Don't miss this part because it's going to come up over and over and over again in the next 20 minutes. Um, Galatians 5.13 says, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not, this is a command, do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh, rather serve one another humbly in love. Galatians 5.1 similarly says, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Lastly, one of my favorite verses, 1 Corinthians 6.12 says, I have the right to do anything you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. So many Christians today are abandoning this freedom that we are given as Christ followers in exchange for being mastered by the culture or their own emotions and experiences. They are slaves to the culture. And this type of message from Christians fueled by injustice or equality is straight from a nuanced gospel or the social justice gospel, which of course is a topic for a whole nother sermon. Um, it is all in blatant contradiction with very much of scripture. And we need to be aware of that as Christians. If you are voting for a candidate who supports limiting or the elimination of religious freedoms in this nation, as an example, let's look at what's happening with Dr. John MacArthur at Grace Community Church in California, the charge being head, uh, led by Governor Gavin Newsom to shut his church down while rioters and looters are allowed to run free. Um, you know, this is happening in our country and we are ignorant to it. If you vote for people like this, you have to answer for that before God one day. Christian or not, you have to answer for who you voted for and what they did in our lives and in our country as a result. You are responsible for that. Any thoughts on freedom? Um, so what I would jump in and add here with freedom, um, America, is, uh, from its very first, um, with the Declaration of Independence, and I'm going to read a, a part of that, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights that amongst these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That's a big thing, pursuit of happiness. You are free to pursue that happiness, but at the same time, you have to make sure that you also look at scripture. We're not guaranteed anything in this life. We are guaranteed if we accept God as our Lord and savior, that our sins will be forgiven and if we ask for it. Um, so, I mean, I, I'll, I'll close with that and I wanna hear other people's thoughts. Yeah, um, in addition to that, I would say that uh, we have to be grateful about our physical uh, freedom because there's uh, spiritual and physical freedom and we have the luck to be um, physically uh, free uh, as we were uh, um, already uh, being set free by Christ. But uh, we have an obligation with that uh, to, to look for freedom for our brothers and sisters that doesn't have that physical freedom that we have. So we, we are not we were not made free just for enjoy by ourselves, but also for sharing to the other people. So I think, uh, Chelsea, I really agree with you. I think if you vote for someone that is trying to um, cut off your uh, rights as a, as a believer, um, you, are, uh, you are not just stopping yourself, um, uh, but also you are, uh, you are taking off the, the right of other people to be free. Uh, and condemning them to not be free in all their lives um, physically. Yeah. I would like uh, the Chinese church to pray in public, but that's not very likely nowadays. Right. Ivana? I think a lot of the changes that we do see in government that seem um, 
to go against freedom are all man-made. Um, and a lot of times we blame God, we blame government, but actually when you're looking at liberty and liberty, especially in America, that's been given to us, it's been given to us based off of um, the commandments that God gave us from the Bible. That's really where it stems from. And that's how it's objective of, or can it be and should be objective across the board because it applies to all people. Now, throughout the years has man um, manipulated it um, due to their own prejudices and things like that. Of course, we can find that in every part of the world. However, it doesn't change the liberties that the law intends to give us. And so when we are trying, when we don't realize what we have, um, we're in a way being ungrateful for what God has set in front of us. And instead of criticizing it, we need to be studying deeper into what is, does the law actually say? And then go back to the Bible. What does the Ten Commandments say? How did God, um, how did this apply in biblical times and then to now? And so I think that's something that needs to be applied um, because you'll see that if you look at the, the Constitution, if you look at those things and you line it up to scripture, even going to Matthew where the Beatitudes are at, um, you see things um, to be merciful to others, to be peacemakers. If you're trying to fight everything that um, the law, I'm just using the Constitution as an example, if you're fighting everything that that um, puts forth, then in a way you're not being a peacemaker, you're not being merciful to others because that's really what um, the law is fighting for because it aligns with the word of God. And I think that's something we're not realizing. Okay, so our next topic, injustice or justice, depending on the way that you want to look at it, hot button topic today in our uh, in our country. And if we define justice, first of all, some of the key words that stood, uh, stood out to me when I was looking this up, equitableness, rightfulness, lawfulness, administering of deserved punishment or reward, which that's a big one, um, maintenance or administration of what is just by the law as by judicial or other proceedings. So by default, injustice is inequity, lawlessness, deserved punishment not being administered or not maintaining uh, what is just by law. So there's a few things I wanna pull out from here lawfulness, first of all, um, we as Christians are subject first to the law of God before the law of the land. Um, we should all be okay with that, uh, that statement. Um, next is deserved punishment, because I think this is a, this is a big uh, spur for um, a lot of what's going on in our country today. Um, I would just like to point out that we as Christians have absolutely no place to condemn any sinner among us, because we should acknowledge first and foremost that we deserve death. Romans 6 23 says for the wages of sin is death but the reality of this is of course that God has every right to enact his justice right now if he so choose or so chose to do so by wiping every single human being off of this planet right we are all evil we do not deserve this grace we do not deserve any of this. Yet he shows us mercy when we do not deserve it. And that is grace. All of us who accept his gift of salvation should embrace this. We should also, of course, embrace and acknowledge that justice is ultimately offered up by God alone. Romans 12, 19, do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. We should take so much comfort in that. I mean, it's not up to us. It's up to God. He's going to have the final say in justice for every single issue in this country, in this world. And speaking of the world, it is, of course, a fallen world. As we know, it will never be perfect. It will never be a utopia. True, true justice is going to come, and it will be carried out by a perfect and just God in his timing. And I think our duty comes until that day, right? What is our, what is our duty until that day? Um, I would say that our mission as Christians is not to hitch our wagon to the fight for social justice, Black Lives Matter organization, critical race theory, any of that, just because it makes us feel good or look good. That is not our mission as a Christian. Um, now, of course, for those who are not Christian, who do not profess that Jesus is Lord, it's absolutely impossible for them to grasp the concept of true justice or injustice because this world is evil. It is ruled by Satan. They don't acknowledge any of this, right? Um, so therefore, 
it becomes very easy for them to support these appearingly good causes like BLM. Um, and it's very easy and, um, you know, makes them feel good to condemn our entire nation as being systemically racist when they can't define the term and there is no proof for that whatsoever. Christians, if you are doing that, please stop. Please stop. Put an end to it. It's ridiculous. Um, so, you know, we could look at Brianna Taylor, her entire situation, and what took place in Louisville as a result of her verdict uh, against those police officers being, you know, they were not charged with murder. Um, you know, they want justice. They want justice. They want justice. Well, what is justice? Because Brianna Taylor in this hearing, um, you know, those police officers for her murder or her death, sorry, untimely death were given, um, you know, a quick process or a quick legal trial, speedy. It was um, impartial. And when looked at the evidence, it was found that there was no murder, right? And so that decision was made based off of the evidence, an unbiased trial, and it was decided by an impartial jur uh, jury. And of course, you know, four or more police officers were killed in Louisville the day that happened um, by Black Lives Matter. And of course, all they know is that they are enraged by injustice when really what they are outraged by is sin from a fallen world and they just don't know it. And this is not outrage for injustice. This is outrage because they are unhappy with the outcome. And justice has nothing to do with the outcome. Justice has to do with the process. And, um, you know, this is obviously a form of vigilante justice. If you're a Christian and your response to the Breonna Taylor verdict was similar to all this that I just described, wanting blood, wanting revenge, um, then I... Ugh, I would encourage you um, to define the justice that you're looking for. Um, you know, what justice would you have preferred that was not achieved here? Um, if you are a Christian and you are avidly taking scripture out of context, like the parable of the 99 sheep, you may have seen that meme floating around social media to support Black Lives Matter, um, which is a Marxist terrible organization. Um, I would ask you to review the mission statement the words spoken and the actions taken by this organization. And please look at them through the lens of scripture because we as Christians by scripture cannot support that organization. Not a single time in scripture has God condemned an individual for a sin that the individual did not commit. Right now, BLM and critical race theory supporters condemn an entire nation and an entire race of people as being racist with no evidence of racism. And that is the very definition of injustice. And they're pushing it emphatically and with support of some in the government. So with this lens of injustice that we have, that I've kind of laid out here, I would like to know your thoughts on this. So um, from a standpoint, so first of all, I always encourage people to research before they ever make a judgment on something. So, you know, um, as Chelsea was saying about racism, so, what is the definition of racism? So I can give you an example from Merriam-Webster Dictionary. Racism is a belief that race is a fundamental determinant of a human traits and your capacities. So your capabilities and that, that superiority, that race is somehow superior and you by your color of your skin, your pigmentation, you're gonna advance. So just by that, be very careful with what you say. The other thing I can say is the most injustice that was ever done on this world was um, was a man by the name of Jesus who came down to this earth, did not commit a sin. He didn't have to come down here. He didn't have to be born as a human. That was not needed to be done. He was crucified as an innocent man. So that's something that we all need to look at and say, hold on, this man died for us and he did not actually have to. That is the biggest injustice this world actually faces. So if you are looking for justice, First of all, research. Second of all, if you don't like the laws that are in place, I would suggest that you write to your legislatures. You do something. You don't go and be a vigilante and say, I'm going to do something. I'm going to break windows. That is not in what Jesus would want. Jesus was actually asked multiple times, hey, be our king, be our leader. He was someone who was not a politician. He did not want to be in government. He didn't want that. He said, we need to be peaceful, turn the other cheek. At the same time, always, you know, like I say, just 
be careful, think, especially when emotions are running high. Um, and so I'll leave it with that and I'll let my other fellow contributors have their piece. Okay, thank you, Brooke. So um, first of all, I, I, I am going to, to make that remarkable. There, there will always be injustice in this world. That's why we say thy kingdom come. And that's why the Bible say, uh, the Bible says, look first for the kingdom of God and its justice. So the justice, the real justice, the perfect and complete justice will be done when he, uh, he come. And that's one of the main things. And it's at the first point in the, in the Lord's prayer, because it's a really, a really important thing. We are looking for justice because we are looking for the justice of God. So my argument is that it's God who says what, what is just and what is not just, not the people. Uh, this, this attaches with this humanistic uh, mindset that uh, lets the people think they can decide what is just and what is not. For example, uh, saying that, uh, looking that there's people that, is, uh, that has more money than others, for them that inequality, that's injustice. But uh, what, that's, that's uh, why, I mean, uh, the, not necessarily uh, inequality means, for example, poverty. You can be rich, but less rich than other. So uh, if we, we can't take by our hand the justice because uh, things like uh, the Black Lives Matter rights uh, can happen and, and those people are not equipped for say what is just and what is not. I, 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 I completely will not obey what these people say because they are acting like criminals. You can tell me that uh, you are looking for justice if you're uh, trying to justify your, your sins. That every, every single thing that you shouldn't do in society, you are defending to do that in order to achieve what other thing I don't know. Um, so, um, I would say that, yeah, I agree, Brooke. I think when the emotions are high, the people uses uh, really uh, strong words that doesn't uh, mean what they are trying to say. Uh, I want to think that, uh, you know, the definition of racism is completely different. Uh, they, they are saying to the people they are racist with uh, strong facility, like everyone is racist. But with, I, don't, uh, I don't know any single person that thinks uh, you are black, so you are inferior. Like, uh, like ontologically inferior, right? That's racism. So I'm, I'm, start, I'm starting to feel like uh, really mad because you think different. So you're a fascist, you are a Nazi, uh, you are a, you're a skinhead or you are a, you're a lot of bad things. You, you hate women and uh, you also think that, I don't know. So. Um, yeah, I, I really uh, encourage these people to think with their heads because their heads are a really gift from God and they should use them. Yeah, that's that's it. That's that's all I, I want to say. Awesome. I like how you said that. They need to think with their heads. Yeah. As a gift. <laughs> there's, there's truth in that. Um, I think you guys really summed up everything that we see going on. And you, you guys mentioned a lot of the things that, that are um, a lot of mess in, in the movements going on. And we're talking about this in a, a fight for justice, right? But people are also justifying their, the actions that they're taking um, in these movements. And what are we seeing? We're seeing division. We're seeing um, not only division, but uh, a, a generation of people that are moving away from the word of God while staying under the name of Christian while proclaiming Christianity. And so we see hypocrisy in that. And I kind of want to focus on what's going on in the church, because um, like Chelsea said, we know that non-believers, they, they think that, oh, the media portrays this as good. BLM, all these things, movements, I want to be on the right side of history, right? But they don't understand what true justice is. However, us as Christians, when we've been in the word of God, or we should be in the word of God, right? When we've um, gone to church and we've heard our pastor hopefully preach um, messages that reflect the word of God, yet we still challenge what the peace that it teaches us, the, um, the humility that it tells us to have, the mercy that it tells us to have on other people. 
Um, yet the the last few months, I have seen relationships of all kind um, be challenged because people are willing to put their own opinions, their pride of the matter to be seen as a social, I think just thinking podcast, they said social justician. That's what it is. They want to be seen as social justician, to be seen right in the, the light of media and what's going on. They put that in front of their relationships, like actually loving people, actually respecting. Um, there are people in the media who are supposed to be um, people of God. And I think as Christians, we know not everyone who claims that they're people of God that they are, right? However, there are public figures who have huge followings. Um, and we see just the discourse in the comments because someone can say, respectfully say a different opinion, yet be attacked while people are still using God in with their attack. And to me, it's so, um, I just see the contradiction in all of it. How can you proclaim that we got to fight um, for peace? We have to fight for the love of these types or for um, this race of people versus this race when you're showing prejudice yourself in your own life. So we're fighting for, or they're fighting for this big movement when in their daily lives, you're seeing the complete opposite of what they say they're fighting for. So um, I just see prejudice overall. And that's something that we really need to um, be praying about. I'll end it with, with this. There's um, this one public figure, a pastor, where if I said his name, you guys would know it instantly. And he, um, when the president said he had coronavirus and the first lady, he put out um, his um, prayers for them and said, and even though he had been for BLM and very much on that side of the movement, he um, expressed that he was praying for them and that us Christians need to do our part. I looked in the comments and about 99% was pure slander, not only towards the pastor, but for our president and for anyone who went against it. And even though, you know, we're used to seeing this, but I was at a loss for words seeing that those who are um, still using scripture in their comments to slander the president. Um, so this is what we're seeing right now, a lot of division um, under the umbrella of Christianity, which we know is not you know, the truth of what the word of God is. And um, this is what us pr Christians need to be praying for is that truth um, and that we be the light in this time. Absolutely, thank y'all. Um, we'll kind of wrap up this injustice section here um, with the same kind of call that I've made here. If you're a Christian and you plan to vote for a candidate who verbally and likely financially supports BLM, like Kamala Harris, who has openly called for and encouraged these rioters to continue rioting and burning down our cities in the name of justice, you will have to answer for this one day because there's no excuse for this whatsoever. Our goal is to seek biblical justice, which only comes when we see everyone as equal, as in Genesis 1:27, and we fully embrace the cause of Christ, which is to see lost souls find their freedom through God's grace. That is justice, period. So with that, we'll move um, into the topic of abortion, which is so funny to me. It seems like this is a, I mean, a no dispute topic for Christians. I don't understand how, yeah, Sam, right? I don't understand how anyone who is a Bible believing Christian can support or condone abortion. And just real quick, we're going to go through um, some scripture and it's actually kind of funny because I just had a conversation um, on the Instagram page with someone um, yesterday, I believe, who told me I believe in God, but the Bible does not talk about abortion. And it's like, well, you know, just because the word isn't there doesn't mean God didn't say anything about it. God is not silent on anything that goes on in our culture today, period. And so, you know, to that, I would like to just address that uh, first and foremost. Uh, God made it abundantly clear that we as human beings are known before the womb and formed in the womb by God. To destroy what God knit together in the womb is sin, period. Um, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. As soon as God knit us together in the womb, your eyes saw my unformed substance, as it says in Psalm 119. The psalmist goes on, in your book, 
were written, or sorry, in your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me when as yet there was none of them. If God says we're fearfully and wonderfully made in the womb, that means that we are brought to life at conception. It says it literally right there. As soon as conception in the womb takes place, he began counting our days, every single one of us. Um, if babies in the womb are indeed alive from conception, then their body has intrinsic value just as any other human body. We are all made in the image of God. Again, Genesis 127, and that alone gives us value from the moment that we are formed. Um, we could continue. Genesis 9, 6 says, whoever sheds the blood of man by man shall his blood be shed for God made man in his own image. This goes for the murder of a born human being as well as an unborn. It is murder, period. That baby is no less uh, made in the image of God as it was knit together in the womb than you or me or Ivana or Brooke or Sam or anyone today. They are the same value. Um, and lastly, you know, just to say the Bible doesn't talk about abortion, it's a, it's a straight up lie. I just, I just explained abortion to you as the Bible sees it. Um, you know, read the word of God as it is and as it was intended. Psalm 127.3 says, behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb, a reward. They are valuable. God sees them as valuable. Jeremiah 1, 5, before you were born, I consecrated you. So the unborn are valued, they are protected, and they are sanctified by scripture. There is no excuse, period, for that. And um, I know Ivana had some thoughts about this. Um, so I'm going to let her kind of take the reins here a little bit. A lot of really good scripture. And um, the fact of the matter is that, that no matter how you put it, it is murder. Um, the sad thing is that there are many people in, in opposition who understand that, yet they still believe that they have that choice or that choice should be for the woman, but you're still not understanding the value of life, the sanctity of life. And um, in that, so we think how can, um, what is the justification for choice? And really it comes down to pride you're putting your choices over um, what God has commanded. You know, you are taking out, you're literally taking out God's creation. You're still birthing a, a human being. A child's gonna come out no matter what. Yet you have chosen to either take their life or now that we've learned that there have been children who have been born and have received no help because they've still been under um, the situation of abortion. They've been allowed to just, um, they weren't given help. and it's, that's what it is, pride. And so I see that, um, we see this in the Bible too. And in um, early, the New T um, Old Testament, we see how the Canaanites, they um, would sacrifice their children um, for Baal, for the idol. So man-made selfish um, intent for pleasure, um, making up your own idols, that's what this world is doing. And so we can look at how clear abortion it is. abortion is, it's murder, yet what it is, it's, it's a fight, it's a spiritual fight with um, our sin, our human um, pleasure, our want to please ourselves, and we justify that for other people also, but I just want to again state that no matter what the situation is um, that would lead someone to want to have an abortion, you know, as sad as it is, because there are so many awful situations, it does not take away, ever take away from the fact that the child, it, it is a child, it's a human being, it's a life, and you're choosing to end it. Absolutely. Thank you, Ivana. Um, you know, it's really sad that many Christians, like um, Ivana mentioned, can believe that abortion is wrong, but also believe that a woman has the right to choose. Who am I to say whether or not she can have an abortion? Well, you are no one to say it, but God is, and he did say very clearly that that is not acceptable. And, you know, if you know that it is wrong, but you condone a woman's freedom, there's that word again, to choose abortion. And if you elect politicians who believe that abortion is a woman's right, you are complicit in every single murder, period. There is no discussion. You are complicit. You do not believe the Bible is true and you sin against God in this reaction and in this belief. And you will have to answer for that one day, especially as a Christian. Woe to those who call good evil and evil good. 
God does not care about your justifications based on your feelings. The Bible is not subjective. It is objective. It is objective truth. And the Bible is settled in heaven. Now, we may argue the right to choose, freedom of choice, right, is not freedom to do whatever we want to do. I'm going to bring you back to Galatians 5.13. Do not use your freedom to indulge in the flesh. Okay, it's right there again. Personal, uh, personal freedom does not excuse us or relieve us of what is in the Bible. Um, and of course, personal agency comes into play here. Scripture says we have to reap what we sow. Choosing to put yourself in a position, I know this is not everyone and not every instance of abortion, but choosing to put yourself in a position to allow you to become pregnant when you are not ready is irresponsible and it is not permission to commit murder. That irresponsibility is an act of injustice. Again, 1 Corinthians 6, 12, I have the right to do anything, but not everything is beneficial, okay? Um, so that, you know, Brooke, Sam, what are your thoughts on this? So my thoughts are, I, I agree with what you have all said thus far. Um, again, my thing, as I always say, is do your research. Um, you know, it's been proven that I, you know, as recently as, you know, 22 days, a, a heartbeat, you can hear from a, a baby has a heartbeat or as soon as 18 days, um, you do your research. Um, this has also been, um, you know, to me, the fact that you, that you have to justify, because there's a lot of justification that goes on of, well, it's my body, my choice. That is so wonderful. That's great until it's not because that thing that's inside you is no longer. So this is my body right here. This is my body. If I'm pregnant right now, you know, that thing inside me is not part of my body. It's just, it's not. And so when you have to look for justification for why you're doing something, it's, you know, that's very far reaching. So I, you know, you look at those scriptures as Chelsea and Ivana have mentioned. And also think about how are you going to justify the fact that, oh yeah, as, as like, you know, it's been recognized 22 days, a baby has a heartbeat, maybe even sooner. So even if you, even if you think, oh, well, I acknowledge it after they have a heartbeat or I acknowledge it after they have, you know, um, maybe uh, fingernails or something like that. Great. But you're justifying at a point where you believe that you can't abort a, a baby. So you're actually putting putting a little bit of a timeline of saying, oh, it's it's not not this until up to this point. Think about what you're doing. You're putting a part in your own moral self so you personally can feel better about your own decision or you're feeling peer pressure that you have to. And you know what? Do not feel peer pressure. People aren't gonna always like what you have to say or your thoughts. But those people, you can you can get along with them. But it doesn't mean you have to agree with them at the end of the day. Because at the end of the day, really, murder is murder. And when you have to justify your actions, think about why you, you're having to justify them. So, yep. Sam, do you have anything? Yeah, what you got, Sam? Well, I'm almost... Oh, wait, you're a man. You're not allowed to speak on abortion. Yeah, no. no, no. We don't get to hear from you. <laughs> I'm... Uh, I'm almost in tears when Ivana was talking, I was about to cry uh, because especially me as a man, I think in the relationship I have with my mother and thinking about this is, is just, I'm thunderstruck. Like this is a really uh, bullet point for me because also Jeremiah one uh, played a role in my conversion mm. from the womb of your mother. I, I knew you, I met you. I, I designed a life plan for you. Uh, for me, this is the most uh, evil thing that exists in the world. I can't imagine nothing worse. It's like killing people by millions and justificating it. It's like, um, well, uh, I'm trying to be rational and not emotional. So I'm, <laughs> I'm going to go with my battery of arguments, but I, I'm, I'm about to cry, really. Um, okay, uh, some people say that, uh, well, a fetus is just a clump of cells, but uh, you know, fetus is just the uh, level of development. Fetus is not what it is. It is a human being in the stage of development called fetus. 
but that doesn't end up when you are born. Then you are a kid. Then you are a teenager. Then you are an adult. Yeah. And, uh, you know, um, and also the social class is not an excuse. Uh, these people that say that they love the poor people and they want to help and they 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 support the working class and all of that. So they hate that much. Uh, the poor people that they don't want them, uh, they, 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 they don't want to allow them to have kids. What's what's the issue with this? And um, well, if you take all the genocide of the history together, Adolf Hitler, um, um, I don't know, Mao Zedong, uh, Lenin, Stalin, all of them, all of them, Mussolini, uh, all of them together, two world wars, all together, not even the same number of uh, the, the, the died people by, uh, by abortion. So that's the biggest genocide in history and is the less criticize, criticized uh, uh, massive killing in the history. Yeah. So the people is protecting more with these uh, Green New Deals and all of that. They protect more an eagle uh, egg than a human being. That's yeah. nonsense. I'm living in a, in a crazy people world. I don't understand. And um, oh, I want Sam, it's so funny you say that. Um, you know, there's a Casting Crown song that the lyric says, save the trees, but kill the children. And I mean, that's that's exactly the society that we're living in, right? So, I mean, you're spot on with that. So Why I don't want to be very, very hard with, with this, but uh, I, I'm going to say uh, the Christians that are not actively and publicly protesting this actively and publicly are cowards but christians at least in this sense and they are collaborating actively or passively but they are collaborating with this genocide which is the biggest genocide in the history of humankind this is the most dark thing i've ever met in my whole life and i know that bad things are going to come but i think Nothing could be worse than this. This is crazy, completely crazy. Yeah. May I add one more thing, if I may? Yeah, yeah. Uh, also, um, for people that going back to candidates, okay? So first and foremost, especially people in the United States, um, we know that Planned Parenthood, um, you know, they're, they are the abortion clinics. So what I would encourage every single person out there, look at why Planned Parenthood was actually founded and yep. what the founder of Planned Parenthood, what her actual mission was. Racist purposes. Yeah. Yeah, and actually establishing Planned Parenthood. And then I want you to think, you know, Joe Biden is supposedly Catholic. I am Catholic, but he supports abortion. So I want you to, that's why I say research and look at all this. Going back to thinking about voting, okay. And even if you don't like the candidates and you're somebody who's against abortion, and you think, oh, everything's great. I want you to make sure you research and look because these people like Joe Biden, who is a professed, you know, he says he's Catholic, but he believes in abortion and he believes in funding that. So please do your research in candidates and also why something was founded, why abortion was founded in this country. Um, so that's, that's what I wanted to add there. Absolutely. So I'm I just would, gonna- I, I would like to, to share a pill of, uh, of hope. Okay. So, uh, uh, I've been studying the case, even though I'm not American, but I've been studying the case Roe versus Wade. And uh, I think uh, there's still hope because uh, the story of Norma Leah McCorby, AKA uh, uh, Roe, <laughs> uh, she was converted to Christian and she was um, really a uh, woman of God um, defending life uh, where, um, wherever he, she went. And uh, she was incredible. And I want to connect that to the story of Robert Spitzer. Robert Spitzer was the scientist that took out from the pathologies list of the World Health Organization, mm -hmm. homosexuality as a problem. And then he regretted as well as in the case of uh, Leah McCorvey. And um, it's, it's easy to find that uh, even though uh, people can make big mistakes, um, they find the truth. And as we were saying, uh, the truth is absolute by definition, because if the truth is not exclusive and uh, 
gets out all the other things that are not the truth, uh, then it's not truth. The truth is always absolute. So these people who, who made some mistakes, but uh, there's always hope. Uh, they they found like the the proper way to to do the things and the, the proper thinking and uh, you know the values of God. Yeah, absolutely. So that was lengthy. I kind of figured that would be the case, but um, <laughs> just to drive this point home, um, I'm going to reiterate. If you know that abortion is wrong, it is sin, and you choose to condone that to other people, and you vote for politicians who believe that it is an okay thing to do, who believe that it is a right, that it is um, women's health care, reproductive right, right? That's the, the saying. If you vote for someone who believes that, you're complicit, okay? Every single baby, that blood's on your hands, and I say that completely unapologetically. Um, you will absolutely have to answer for that one day. And I implore you Christians do not vote for anyone who supports and believes that it is okay to murder um, the unborn. And consciousness is flexible. You know, first of all, it was one month and three months. Now in New York, I, I tragically had to see that in New York, it was still nine months. That's, that's, <laughs> I I can't understand. I, no, really, I, I, I really can't understand. I agree. I mean, what makes a baby six inches inside of a mother, not a baby, but six inches through the birth canal, you know, it's now suddenly a valuable human life. That's the same baby five minutes before it was passed through the birth canal. So, okay. So the last thing we're going to talk about today is the biblical response to socialism. And um, I'm going to turn this right away over to Brooke to uh, get us introduced into this topic and whatever um, she's prepared to share with us about socialism. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Chelsea. So um, I don't know, those of you have heard, maybe, you know, this has come up recently, and it's about Jesus being a socialist, that he was a socialist. Um, so now... The thing about that is that what I what I first like to point out is Jesus was never a political figure, um, and also to begin with, um, Jesus was came to this earth way before the philosophy um, of socialism was ever created. So I'd like to just establish those two points. Now moving on to um, some scriptures to what um, people who say that Jesus uh, is a socialist um, they refer to. Um, a scripture in Luke, I believe, yeah, Luke, and it's chapter 12, and it's verse 15. So it's, the basis of that is, hey, take heed and beware of all the covetousness, uh, for a man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions, meaning, hey, be careful, watch out for that greed, and people with money, you know, they are, there. that's really bad. Well, now I'm going to say, you need to read the entirety of that part of the scripture. So Luke 12, starting with um, your chapter 12, verses 13. So this is about the parable of the rich fool. So um, I'll quickly summarize this. This is about a brother who comes to Jesus and says, hey, I, would, I want you to uh, make, my, make my brother divide the property equally of our inheritance. And Jesus responds with, um, man, who made me a judge or a divider over you? Who made me someone to say, I need to divide a property? That's not, Jesus never advocated for saying here, I'm going to equally divide a property. Um, and so that's one example that I can give you. Another example is in Matthew uh, chapter 24. And, and it's in, starts with verse 14 and goes all the way to 30. Um, so, but that is known as the parable of the talents. And talents is, talents in those days was considered the money. Uh, so just, you know, I encourage you to read that, but the basis of that is, is that he was promoting saying, Hey, guess what? You have all this money that I have given you, you know, giving the servants money. And then they go and invest it. And the one that does not invest it and goes and buries it and hides it, um, is rebuked for it because wait, you didn't go out and you didn't go and invest. You didn't go and make more. So that is actually in reverse of, you know, the government being, uh, you know, rejecting capitalism, which is, hey, go out, make your own, make your own endeavor. Instead of 
uh, no, here, bury the money and just make sure it's there. And just, you know, I think the phrase is, you know, oh, you fool, you know, you're, you're being lazy. You're a worthless servant saying to the one who just buried their money. So those are just two examples where Jesus is saying, Hey, you know, you, you have to work for what you have. I don't have any, you know, I'm not a judge to say we need to divide our property. And yes, Jesus says that we pay taxes unto Caesar, but he's not saying, you know, pay unto Caesar's what is Caesar's and everything that is Caesar, whatever Caesar says is his, is his. And then funding, you know, the government by, for, you know, to help fund a welfare or, or a, you know, that type of organization, instead of you freely giving and donating to charities that will help the poor. Jesus never advocates for saying, hey, guess what? Give unto Caesar what is Caesar's, whatever he says is Caesar's. And that is how the poor are going to be helped. It is your own personal responsibility to do that. So to say that Jesus was a socialist, I mean, he never was and isn't. So, um, and the other thing is that socialism makes you rely on the government for everything. And it has always failed and it's not going, you know, so what I can say is that we are made to rely and be dependent upon God, not upon government, not upon, you know, another person. So you have to rely upon God, put your work in. That's the thing that I'm going to say about that. And from there, I will turn it over. Yeah, thank you. That was excellent. Um, I will add very quickly, um, 2 Thessalonians 3, 6 through 10, um, where Paul is addressing the Thessalonians. And he says, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we command you brothers to keep away from every brother who is idle and does not live according to the teaching you received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example. We were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's food without paying for it. On the contrary, we worked night and day, laboring and toiling so that we would not be a burden to any of you. We did this not because we do not have the right for such help, but in order to make ourselves a model for you to follow. For even when we were with you, we gave you this rule. If a man will not work, he shall not eat. <laughs> and I mean, you know, it says it pretty much straight up right there. Um, there's nowhere in scripture where God transfers the power of caring for and meeting the needs of those around us from the church to the government. This is the church's job by, uh, by scripture. Deuteronomy, what's up? How are you? Oh yeah, absolutely. As Christians, Deuteronomy 15, seven through 11 spells out how we as the church are to care for those around us. James 1 27 says religion that God, our father accepts as pure and faultless is this to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. We have this duty. We are not to rely on the government. Okay, that is, I mean, straight up, God never gave the role of caring for the people to the government. He, he established the church for this reason. Um, and I think it's also important to note that, of course, kind of like we've already said, whoever um, sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly, not under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Nowhere in scripture are we commanded to give up our own possessions against our will. Nowhere. Um, we reap what we sow, and at no point does he force anyone to give up their property. There's a reason for the 10th commandment. Do not covet what your neighbor has, because God honors personal property, and he honors personal ownership. And I think that's something that people need to keep in mind as we move forward in this country, especially with this election that's coming up, because a lot of this is fueled by straight-up greed, and it's masked as empathy, and it is not true whatsoever. Um, Matthew 9, 24, of course, or 19, 24, of course, um, which Brooke may have mentioned just now, I know she brought it up earlier, um, that, you know, it's harder for um, a rich man to get into heaven than it is for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle. Um, greed is a deadly sin. And we see it more and more, um, you know, in society today. So um, Sam and Ivana, I will gladly hear your thoughts on this. <laughs> yeah. 
this is quite funny for me. Uh, I think the, the socialist Christians, they think uh, it has nothing to do with them uh, to help the poor and all of that. Uh, you know, oh, no, I don't have money. It's the government who has to take care. It's yeah. like, uh, yeah, yeah, we have this commandment. So you have more money. You should take care. I don't, uh, I don't have this obligation. That, <laughs> that's yeah. uh, kind of smart. <laughs> yeah. uh, funny for me. Um, yeah, so... Actually, um, is the, the, this dependence of the government is present, uh, which is not a Christian uh, um, um, cosmovision, and um, uh, the yeah the political political liberty had, has uh, three principles, right? Uh, right to right to life, uh, right to individual li uh, individual liberty, and uh, the right to private property. And we see in the seventh and in the tenth commandment that the Bible clearly supports uh, private property. So these people think that uh, they own what the, the other people gained. And uh, when when they present, uh, actually they have presented me this Jesus several times. This Jesus that is Gandhified, kind of Gandhi style, but not grandified, right? <laughs> So that's uh, kind of strange for me because I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna take two parables, uh, the parable of the workers, which uh, he paid the workers, the laborers, uh, the the salary he wanted. It, it was not fixed price, not uh, plus value. I don't know how it's in, in in English. Plus value, yeah, not nothing like that. Not fixed price. He paid whatever he wanted. Yep. And also in the parable of the talents. Um, Actually, uh, two of the servants are declared to be true servants of their master, and one is called weak and slothful. So he really wants you to take your, uh, your talents, your gifts, your uh, capacities, and all of that, and exploit them. Uh, so also, Paul says, if you don't want to work, you don't eat. It's that simple. So that is the rational context for this. But the people prefer to feel like more secure uh, on the on the top of uh, government helpings and all of that. But uh, it will turn very bad because it will be like in Argentina, for example. In Argentina, they are giving money to the poor people, but they are obligating them to assist to some social protest, uh, as for example, uh, things of witchcraft. Okay, this is happening right now in Argentina. Wow. So the for, for these people that, that are between Christianism and socialism is that they want to depend on government. They can't escape right now because their incomes come from the government. And when the government says, go and do this, you go and do this because you don't want to, you don't want to uh, be with, without money. But that is a real, real, real conflict. You cannot depend on the government because they will defy you. And... Um, also, um, uh, you know, uh, socialism has been uh, the first cause, first cause of persecution of the church and the Christians in the world, uh, with all along with uh, radical Islam as well. But uh, socialism, oh, then when socialism gets together when, uh, with uh, Islam, as in Iran, for example, that's uh, double dangerous. <laughs> like a game but you know uh, socialism in Cambodia in Vietnam uh, the, 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 the greatest massacres of Christians and the greatest uh, uh, like tropolis that you could think of uh, that was all socialism and also they have a perspective that is human humanism so as they as they think with humanism they they don't think about God in any time they just depend on themselves and it's kind of, um, they are the new Pharisees, you know? Uh, they think the people from the right wing, they are Pharisees because they think they are better than the others. But actually, they have that, uh, that uh, narrative uh, about moral superiority. They think that they are better because they support this cause and the other cause, and I defend women, and I defend black people, and I defend blah, 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 blah. You don't care. You just don't want to follow God, and you prefer to seem a good a good person uh, towards the eyes of the people from the world but you don't really care you just need another thing that is justice but it's not the justice from god so it's just about looking good so yeah. they are the new pharisees because they think they are better 
and they preach out loud that they help these people and the other people. But actually, when it comes to the end of the day, they are the people that less help people. They don't help anybody. They just are trying to help themselves. It's yep. These uh, postmodern psychiatrists that, oh, look in yourself, uh, uh, in you, follow the dreams of your heart. The heart is bad. The heart is really bad. Don't follow the heart. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. So, Thank you, Sam. <laughs> that was as, great. As a last thought, uh, yeah. me personally, I, I've met people that uh, were in the midst uh, between socialism and their beliefs in Christ. And actually, I personally met uh, a couple of people that they abandoned their faith because obviously, uh, I don't care if socialist Christians don't agree with me. Uh, socialism principles and Christianity are not compatible. So they had logically to choose and they preferred uh, the socialism, the world justice cosmovision, the, the, the world justice worldview, not the Christ uh, worldview. So it's really dangerous. Uh, like my political ideas took me in Christ and other political ideas could take you off Christ. So uh, watch out. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you, Sam. Ivana, do you have anything to add? Um, I think Sam gave a lot of good uh, pieces of evidence uh, about socialism. So I think what needs to happen is people need to um, research. They need to look at history and see why is capitalism um, against socialism and vice versa. What are the differences? And then look at your own faith and look at the liberties that you have at this moment in your country where you're at. And um, think about how does this affect you and how does this affect others? And um, even though people are putting the front that that's what they're doing to seem good in the, the spotlight of others, but um, really that, that's what they need to do. And um, I think that would, if they really were looking for truth, I think that would change their perspective. Yep, absolutely. That was great. Thank you all. Um, I would say we're going to wrap this one up the same way. If you support a candidate who believes in and will fight for a socialist economy or a socialist society in our country, despite all of the scriptural evidence and historical evidence against this immoral form of government and economy, you will have to answer for that someday. And I implore you, please look into this further on your iPhone right, which you would not have without capitalism. So let's just put that out there. Um, you know, please look into that before you cast your vote for someone who is ascribing to that, um, to that worldview, because that's what we're all about here, right, looking at the worldview. So um, that brings us through everything that we wanted to talk about. And so I'm just going to give a um, a call to action, but uh, first I'm going to give all of you just an opportunity to kind of give your uh, parting thoughts, your, um, you know, your concluding statements about everything we've talked about and, um, you know, speak as you want to, but, you know, just be conscious of the time. <laughs> so what I will leave everyone with here today is that if you take um, anything away from this, it should be this, that your ability, you have the ability actually much greater than what most of humanity has had in the past to have research at your hand, be able to see here, I have my Bible. This is what it says. Okay. Then look at what are people saying? What are the people that are in office or running for office? What are their beliefs? What is their conduct? What is their voting record? You have that ability with your iPhone or you know your iPad or whatever. Go and do that now. Look up what the actual origins of what you're thinking about. I want you to look for yourself. Do not take our word for it. Look for yourself because that's what at the end of the day is going to actually solidify what you believe. Look at your Bible, pick up your iPhone, start looking and researching and look at both sides. So that way you can at least see why one side is the same and why one side is the other. But at the end of the day, the Bible is your foundation. That is your bedrock starting point of research. And from there on, research. That's what I'm going to, my parting advice for all of you. Thank you, Brooke. How about you, Sam? Um, well, I, um, I would just say, um, look for the truth and you will find it. And also I'm going to close with a, uh, um, 
glory, glory to God in the highest and peace to men of good will. I think, I think that's all I have to say. Awesome. Thank you. All right, Ivana. I would say if you're looking for truth, look at it with an objective man in an object objective manner. And um, if you are a Christian, uh, then pray. Pray for the election, pray for your enemies, pray about everything. And I think the Lord's gonna guide us through this. Awesome. Thank you guys. So um, in wrapping this up, I'm gonna give you guys sort of a call to action, but uh, first, I want to read a quote from uh, the Just Thinking podcast, and if you have not looked at this uh, podcast, I'm just telling y'all you need to. It's uh, incredible. Um, this is from episode 72, where they discuss the Equality Act of 2019. Um, Virgil Walker said, we are witnessing the recreated order of humanity in the image of humanism. We have elevated feelings to the throne of worship and are determining that the text of this new orthodoxy will be codified into law by the government. Violators will be punished, so you must bow the knee and genuflect to the whims of the new prophets, who are the politicians in Washington. We've got to wake up as Christians and do something about it. So with that said, um, I would just like to kind of summarize that being a Christian means something and being a Christian in name only is worthless and damaging to the collective. Um, claiming his name when we call ourselves Christians means that we acknowledge the ultimate price that he paid for our sins. And it means that we will strive to live a life that is most honoring to the gospel, to the word of God and to the name of Jesus Christ. And how we vote is not isolated from this obligation to honor him. We elect those who shape the policy of our nation. Many who proclaim to be Christians are guilty of electing politicians who have put legislation into action that is directly against the word of God. We as individuals will be held accountable before God one day for the actions of those whom we helped elect. That is a great responsibility that more Christians should take very seriously. And so I ask you, does your political ideology align with scripture? If the answer is no, then I would ask you seriously, why are you a Christian? Do you know what it means to be a follower of Christ? And what do you believe about the Bible? If your political ideology is in conflict with the inerrant word of God, then how or why are you following him or glorifying him? If you are unsure if your political ideology aligns with scripture, please do not vote until you know what you believe and why you believe it and what those candidates believe. I implore you to, with urgency, look for those answers within the word of God and then do the research that you need to do yourself. And so with that, I believe we can close out on this round table like two hours long of a Christian's obligation to vote. Thank you all so much for being a part of this. Um, I am... Read one verse, please. Yeah, read one verse. <laughs> Came to my mind and I, I, I really think we, um, the, the, the main question of, of, of today was uh, what means to be a Christian? So I would like to read um, John, John 15, 18. If the world hates you, keep in mind that he that it hate, hated me first. If you belong to the world, it will love you as its own. And it, it is you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Remember what I told you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. Amen. That is what men, what means to be a Christian for me in this world? Absolutely, that's our that should be our worldview, right? And we we should take that first of all. That's a promise. That is not a maybe. That is not a you might be hated. You might be persecuted. And we should wear that hatred and that persecution with absolute honor and pride for what it means to stand for the name of Jesus. And there are way too many Christians who bow, bend the knee, 
to that persecution instead of standing straight for Jesus in the midst of that hatred and persecution. I'm so glad you just read that. Thank you so much. Um, now, with all this said, uh, please get connected with Trinacy. If you are watching this video, you can find us on Instagram at Trinacy International, website trinacy.org. We've got a Facebook page, Conservative Christians on Campus. Um, we have a mentorship program that will be rolling up in January, our next round. These mentees here um, will hopefully be able to sing our high praises for this program, um, you know, in the coming months while they continue to walk through it. And I would encourage you to get involved in that if you are looking for solid biblical mentorship um, in this uh, period of your life.